So good morning and welcome to James Way's Webinar Wednesdays. Uh, this week I'm joined by Dr. Keith Bramwell. Um, after a 20 year career in academia, he has decided to join us here at James Way as our senior technical advisor, um, working on product development and also on consulting in the field, helping you solve your hatchery problems. So welcome Keith and thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Today's topic is uh, something that I'm very interested in because it's really not something that is in my wheelhouse and that is embryo diagnosis. So using um, what you see in your breakouts to let you know where maybe something is going wrong in your incubator or hatcher to improve that chick quality. So that's gonna be super interesting. Um, looks like we might have a few new names on here today. So I'm just gonna give you guys another overview on the controls. In your top left corner, there's gonna be a little control panel the first button is the video and audio settings in case you're having some problems there. Then there is also the Q&A button. You can use that to enter any questions you have for Dr. Bramwell during this, um, this webinar and we'll get to them live on air. If we don't get to them, we will email you with a response. Um, there's a chat box. You can send us a chat message directly to the panelists or you can chat with everyone else that's online right now. Um, and finally, there's a raised hand box. So if everyone could just give me a raised hand, let me know that you found your controls and you're ready to go. Looks good. All right. So on to uh, embryo diagnosis. Great. Um, we're, what we're going to talk about as part of part as part is the embryo diagnosis is kind of a two part series. Um, obviously, it goes hand in hand with um, embryology and development of the embryo. But the reason why it's so important to look at embryo diagnosis is because what we're trying to do is, is obviously we want to examine our chicks to look at chick quality. But the other thing we want to do is we want to look at the failures that we find in the incubator. From those failures, we can learn what needs to be done to improve our um, procedures and mechanisms to get better chick quality. So those are just as important, the failures, um, the, the failed embryo developments and failed chicks hatch, as the actual quality of the chicks that do hatch. So we'll go through a, a series of um, uh, discussions where we're talking about their different stages of development along the way. And, uh, and then how to interpret those, what those mean, so as you're troubleshooting um, areas in your hatchery, we can um, move forward and, and make some improvements. Sounds good. All right, let's share your presentation again. Okay. Okay, um, like Tori said, I'm with uh, James Way Incubator Company. I was with uh, an academic side for about 20 plus years, working in all areas of breeder and hatchery um, reproduction. And um, so this is a, the, one of the two-part series called Embryo Diagnosis. Um, basically, it's a breaking out of the hatch residue or the unhatched eggs um, in our hatch baskets. First, I always like to start off talking about the fertilization process. Nearly every talk I've given in the last few years, I, I incorporate this because I think it plays a role in what we um, are trying to do and we need to understand this process. I'm not going to go into incredible depth, but um, you can see from this slide here, um, from the initial um, insemination process, whether it be artificial insemination or natural insemination, um, there's a series of events that occur within the hen after that semen is deposited. Um, that are um, necessary to result in the fertilization of that avian egg. The avian egg is fertilized in the infundibulum, which is the upper portions of the oviduct. Um, and this occurs, the upper portion of the oviduct, the infundibulum then will grab that yolk once it's, once it's ovulated, pull it into the um, top of the oviduct, and that's when our egg formation begins. That fertilization process then will occur within the first five minutes after ovulation. It occurs very quickly right after ovulation. As soon as that ovum or yolk is released from the ovary and it enters into the oviduct or infundibulum, an albumin coat starts being put around that yolk and that's essentially the egg white. That albumin um, coat has an inhibitor that will inhibit any further fertilization process from occurring. 
So within minutes, fertilization occurs. Once albumin begins to be deposited, um, fertilization process is over. And so all fertilized eggs have to be fertilized in those first few minutes of, um, after ovulation. Then that yolk is then captured into the oviduct and starts traversing down the oviduct. As we know, it takes about 24 to 26 hours for complete formation of that shell as it passes through um, the various portions of the oviduct. And the hen's body temperature, here shown in Celsius, 40 to 41 degrees is about 104 to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And that obviously is warmer than the temperature that we use for incubation. So what that means is, is that we have a fertilized egg entering to the oviduct, spending 24 to 26 hours in that oviduct as the rest of the albumin, shell membrane, and shell is formed. So when that egg is laid, we then have a, an egg, laid egg that's representing one day of embryo growth. In other words, 20 to 40,000 cells of that embryo. Kind of one of the um, trick questions I, I ask people often is how long does it take for an embryo to fully develop from the time of fertilization to hatch? Most people say 21 days. Counting this day, it's actually 22 days because you have a full day of development before the egg is laid. The reason why this is important is when we start thinking about what we do with those laid eggs from the time they're laid to the time we put them in our incubators. It is not a fertilized egg waiting to start embryo development. It is a fertilized egg that has already started that, like I said, has 20 to 40,000 cells development, so the embryo is already in that growth phase. It makes it a little bit different when we think about what we do with those hatching eggs after the time of lay to the time they get in the incubator because we already have growth going. Um, the site of fertilization, obviously, is the germinal disc, the little white dot, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a minute. That is where the initial stages of embryo development will occur. We can see on two eggs here, hopefully you can see it on your screen, um, the egg on the left is an infertile egg, the one on the right is a fertile egg. And the one on the right, you can see a little donut-shaped ring around that germinal disc area. That is representative of that cellular growth I was talking about. So an egg freshly laid, not in the incubator yet, most of the time, we can look at those eggs and determine if they're fertile or not. That infertile egg on the left, you see, is more compact and dense and in a solid center. The fertile egg on the right is more of a donut shape because we're starting that cellular development already. Just one thing to kind of tie the two together because this will make a little bit more sense later and I'll, and I'll refer to it is there's a relationship with our fertility and our embryonic mortality, a direct relation that doesn't have anything to do with our incubation, egg storage, um, anything like that. It's just a direct relation to the sperm within the hen and how long that, hen, that sperm resides within that hen. The hen, um, all avian species are able to store sperm from that male. Chickens, it's 20, 25 days. Turkeys, it can be 40 days or longer. It varies and it varies among breed strain and, and type. But they're able to store sperm. So when a hen is fertilized by a rooster, if she is not mated um, after that in, in initial fertilization, we will see embryo or fertility begin to drop. As, as we can see here, the red line um, are those representative of the fertility levels of those hens inseminated with 200 million sperm, and you can see on the bottom that's days post insemination, so four days, six days, eight days after a single insemination. Fertility will hang on for a while if there's enough sperm there. As we get out to 10, 12, 14 days, as indicated in this graph, we see fertility really begin to drop. What is interesting is of those fertile eggs, when we get out to 12, 14 days, of those fertile eggs, we start to see an increase in early embryo mortality. Again, this has nothing to do with how the eggs are stored, how our incubators work. This is biology. The sperm is stored by the hen, but there's something about um, the hen can store it for a period of time, and after a while it begins to lose um, its ability. It can still fertilize, but the, uh, the developing embryo is compromised, and we will see loss. We can see out here 16, 18 days after single mating, we're getting 40, 50 to 60 percent of the fertile eggs dying embryo mortality. So when we see in breeder flocks, 
whether small or big, as we see fertility start to drop, particularly as they get older, but at any time we see less frequent mating, we will see a drop in fertility. We will nearly always see an increase in embryo mortality. And our older flocks, people that have been in the industry a long time understand this. In older flocks, fertility goes down, embryo mortality goes up. And this is just a biological function of the hen's ability to store um, sperm in a viable fashion or not if it's stored there too long. So when we're talking about embryo diagnosis, a um, couple of things here. It's important for managers um, to have direct knowledge of the breakout results. They should monitor and, and the handling breakout procedure routinely, correlate with the people that are doing the breakout. Um, if there's multiple people doing the breakout, those people need to um, work together so everybody is on the same page. If the managers can, periodically assist in the breakouts, especially if there's some problems. Um, sometimes we see issues, we see situations where it looks like we have a certain problem, maybe with early embryo mortality, and in reality it's a, it's a fertility issue, and there might be some um, problems with the way they determine fertile or infertile um, eggs. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but I think having more eyes on it is always a good thing as well. So record keeping, um, I'll show you a chart in a little bit, and this is it's a chart that I've used, but you have to decide what you want and are going to record. And some basic things we always want to record, of course, infertile eggs. We want to know how many eggs are infertile. Um, dead embryos in one of three to five stages, depending on how much you want to break it out. And I'll talk about this when I show you the chart. Pips, in other words, the chicks that have pipped, started the, the hatch process, and failed for one reason or another. Cull chicks, cull eggs, farmer transfer cracks, contamination, obviously, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then eggs that might have been misplaced, small end up. Recording all these so we can see uh, what the incidence rate is, and it'll help us troubleshoot. Some people, and I think this is a very good idea, will look at weight loss from, the, from their eggs, um, and this is probably one of the best ways to really know how um, our, our humidity, the humidity level in, in our incubators, if it's where we want it. We want a certain amount of weight loss. We want about 0 0.55, 0 0.7% per day is acceptable, ideal, 0.665 um, per day in that range. And we will typically weigh eggs, a sample of eggs prior to set, weigh them again at transfer, and this is at the transfer moisture loss. And um, if we stay within this range, we ought to be um, doing pretty good. Um, when we're troubleshooting, can the problems be identified with specific flocks or ages? These, these things are always very um, important for me, whether it be a big flock or a small flock, is if we say we have a hatch problem, or we have an embryo mortality problem, well, is it hatchery-wide? Is it only for specific flocks? Is it only for certain ages of flocks? Can you isolate it to certain hatcher hall or hatchers? How about weather patterns? You know, I've, I've received calls before where um, we've come in and they've said, um, we've got a lot of embryo mortality and we go back and look at weather and realize it was just ridiculously cold at that time. Well, that gave us an idea of what to look for that might have been um, a causative factor for some of our embryo loss. So seasonal changes, um, changes in management practice, personnel, things like that is what has changed at about the time um, we saw some problems. Does the problem persist? Second one is what is normal or what should be expected. This is one reason why doing an embryo diagnosis is important. We have to know what's normal or what should be expected. If we don't know what's normal and we somebody comes and says, oh my gosh, we're seeing, you know, 3% early dead, well, what do you normally get? I don't know, but that seems high. We have to know what's normal, and that way when we see aberrations from those values, we can go back and this is what it should be. How is a certain bird or combination performed in the past if you've changed breeds or breed strains? <clears throat> and having an action plan, I think this is um, very important. Story I've told a number of different times, I was in a hatchery one time, Manager said, oh, we've been doing breakouts for several years. And I go, so what do you do with the data? And I go, we put it in the file cabinet because that's what we're told to gather data. Okay, that doesn't do much good. We've got to have an action plan. We've got to have the accurate breakout records. 
Um, there's got to be involvement with the managers, supervisors, um, summarize that data, analyze it, and then make a decision from that as a management tool to improve your hatchery. And I'm not, this is just for your information. You're going to get a, a, a copy of this, I believe, and so you can kind of go and do some a little bit of research if you want. When I start talking about embryo staging and development, it comes from some very old classic um, literature. Hamburger Hamilton's probably the most common that people refer to in staging embryo development at a very um, basic level. So this is a, a hatch sheet that I have used in the past for different trials. Every company or situation might be a little bit different depending on what they're being asked to, um, what data they're being asked to gather and collect. Um, but this is kind of a sample of what I will look at where you can record, you know, incubator setting, hatchery, um, date, all that. Important things on here, um, the number of infertile eggs. Always got to have, have an accurate assessment of the number of infertile eggs. This is probably one of the areas I see um, sway one way or another the most. You know, we might see one day they, they claim very high um, early embryo mortality, but miraculously they have very few infertile eggs. You know, if you really get down and look at it, there's probably some of those they were calling early days were really infertile or vice versa. This is one of the areas there that early dead infertile, I think, get confused so. But we've got enough infertiles. Our early dead embryos, um, I break them up into these two categories and I'll talk about the difference in the two. And what I try and do, if you look at my chart here, is I, I try to have very distinguishable um, identifying factors of the embryo to allow me to move it into one category or the other so it's not this guessing game. I've seen sheets where they try and say, this died at day one, day two, day three, day four. I don't care. I just want to know who died in the first three days, if an embryo died four to seven days, if it died in the middle stages. Um, and so infertiles, early dead, that first week, I break them up into these two categories. And then the other one is the late dead, um, that last week, break them up into 15 to 18 and then 19 to 21. Most of the time our eggs are transferred into our hatchers in that 18th day sometime, um, and there's there's causative factors why that might vary. Um, but I will break those up because your 19 to 21 is really a hatcher issue, although some of those failures could be related to incubation. So we're looking at we're looking at the the three most important areas on this breakout sheet. Like I said, there's a couple of things that I really um, try to stick to to make sure if you can identify these things, it'll help you put. Um, embryo mortality in the right category, fertile egg, donut shaped germal disc, some development there, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more later about some of the th ways people miscall this, um, but basically our, our zero or three is going to be those fertile eggs. Day four, a, a very important thing happens, there's eye pigmentation and it is prominent. If you have an embryo and you're looking at it and you start spending any time at all looking to see if the eye is pigmented, it's not prominent. It's day three. If you look at it right away and you can see that, yep, there's the eye. I can see the pigment in the eye. That's prominent. It at least made it to day four. So now we've got something potentially in that four to seven day category. On day eight, remember my, my chart has zero to three, four to seven. Day eight, the egg tooth, is present and prominent. Once again, don't spend time looking at that embryo to see if you can find an egg tooth. If you look at the embryo, move it around a little bit, you don't see an egg tooth, it's not prominent. If it's prominent, you know it made it to day eight, that will put that embryo then in that middle uh, mortality category. So here's an eye, eye pigment, very easy to see, obvious, you open this egg, look at it, boom, there's the eye, you're going to have variations in there. Um, that pigmentation will come on relatively quick, but you can have times where you sort of see it. Again, you've got to have everybody consistent on what's prominent. And I, I just like to say, it's there, it's there, you have to hunt for it, it's not. And then the egg tooth, right on the end of that chick there, it will be there before that eighth day. But again, it needs to be prominent. If you see that egg tooth, um, and, and easily, it's in that middle dead category. 
Day 15, the check down should be prominent. Yes, it will have check down in the days before that. You gotta get, draw a line there to get with the people that are doing the breakout and know that, um, okay, yes, there's down, it's very evident. We're gonna call that a 15 day and beyond. And then day 19 is when we start seeing the yolk sac withdrawn into the body. And between that 18 and 19 day, this is going to begin to occur. So that's where you, again, you've got to get people and decide, okay, what stage do we say, okay, there's enough of that yolk sac drawn into the body. For me, the majority of it was drawn into that body, it hit day 19. And we're still seeing a significant amount of yolk outside. It might be started, but a significant amount is out. Then it'll be a day 18 um, embryo loss. So these are kind of some of the key factors I look at to help me put, um, embryo mortality in the right spot. Okay, when we talk about what's normal and what's acceptable, one thing I have to stress is this is a biological system. Therefore, fertility 100% is not possible. Hatch of fertile, 100% not possible. Hatchability, 100% not possible. Chip quality, 100% perfect, not possible. And I've had discussions, I don't argue with people, I've had discussions with people that say, oh no, we get 100% fertility. Well, they looked at 20 eggs. Okay, yes, on a small number, you can have 100% of any of these. On a big scale, when we're looking at real numbers, it's a biological system. You cannot have 100% fertility, hatch fertile, or hatchability. So what is acceptable? We, we have to accept some mortality losses. It's unavoidable. So fertility, um, you know, at the peak of production, um, we can get one to two percent infertile eggs, so ninety-eight to ninety-nine percent fertility. It is possible, um, and that's dependent on the breed or strain, age of flock, health status, breeders, management, a number of different things. Um, but we can get fertility. Notice this is not a hundred percent fertility. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine percent is possible. Now, don't be getting after somebody because they don't have. 98% fertility in a 60 week old breeder flock. That's not possible or very unlikely. But at the right times, you can have um, 98, 99% fertility. Embryo mortality, four to five percent total embryo loss is biological, it's acceptable, depending on the breed or strain, the age of the flock, fertility level. Remember, we talked about that. When fertility starts to drop, we will get higher embryo mortality. Egg age, how long were those eggs stored? Are they taken right directly out of the chicken, put in the incubator? Those won't hatch as well either. Um, have they been sitting around for two weeks? They're not gonna hatch as well either. Egg storage conditions, temperature, transport, and of course our incubation conditions. Again, there's biological mechanisms in place here that we can't control, so there is certain amounts of loss that have to be um, expected. So when we look at a normal distribution from day zero to day 21, this is kind of, I don't have numbers on the side, but I'm just kind of giving you a trend that's generally what we see. In that first week of, um, of incubation, we're gonna typically see this peak in um, early embryo mortality, or in mortality two to two and a half percent in that first week, that middle range about a half a percent or less, and then in the last um, week, we're going to see two and a half to three percent. And th these are normal numbers of what we'll see. The reason why we see some of these numbers is in that first week, we have what's called, have something going on, it's called cell differentiation. So the cells within these embryos are like, okay, your brain cells, you're going to be liver cells, you're going to be um, ovary, ovary cells or gonadal cells. So you have this cell differentiation. When that doesn't occur properly, we will have embryo loss. Interestingly enough, this is the same relatively, about the same time period, you will often see miscarriages in humans, cattle, dogs, other livestock species, is at the time of cell differentiation. In those mammals, they can abort the fetus. In our avian system, they can't abort the fetus, so it just dies and it stays there. So this is a normal thing due to biology that we see just as things are supposed to be occurring and developing if they don't occur pro properly, they just die, and that's, that's a, a normal function. In the later stages, 
um, that embryo is switching to um, pulmonary respiration. And that means that when that chick pips and into that egg and it starts, the first time switches from receiving its oxygen through its um, cardiovascular system, and now it's through its pulmonary system. And if that activity does not occur properly, we're going to have some loss, embryo losses as well. And then that last stage is, is just purely hatch problems. It's trying to get out of the egg. Um, whether they were in pip ride, there was other factors in there. Um, but the actual process of hatching um, can cause us some losses at this time. So looking at these first three days, one to seven, again, two and a half, two to two and a half percent. That's when our blood circulation system is developing, cell differentiation is occurring, potential causes, typically poor egg handling, um, aged flocks or infrequent mating. Um, the middle week, um, low, half percent or less, potential causes, breeder nutrition, um, and you know, you could possibly have incubator problems, but typically that's a nutritional component of the breeder hens, and in my 20-something years of experience doing this, I have not gone out into a breeder flock and said, oh my gosh, those nutritionists have got to do something different because we're getting 3% midweek. It just doesn't happen. I think for the most part, we're, we know enough about nutrition of breeders that we're really seeing very low levels of um, midweek mortality. If you're starting to see high 1% or, or close to that or even more, I personally would actually question more where they're calling the embryos that some of those should have been early or late. And that's normally what I see is not really a, a midweek problem. And then again, that last week when we switched to pulmonary respiration, this could be a function of uh, mortality in this last week. Incubation problems, temperature, humidity, turning, pull time, set time, age flock, shell quality, contamination, there's a number of things that can cause that um, mortality in that late stages. And this is just a chart we've seen and it kind of shows, and this is gathered from some industry type, industry data, kind of shows the same thing I was talking about is your, um, your normal or average or standard is gonna be about two and a half to three percent early. Maybe let, if you're a good producer, you can be less. And then late, again, about that two and a half percent ballpark. And so this is, again, normal. So just as a very ballpark before I get into some of the actual staging of the embryos, and I think this is some, what I've talked about till now is, is probably some of the more important information, but there will be some more important information later as well. But looking at the same chart that we used a little bit ago, we're looking at this trend right here. And we see embryo mortality in that first week. It is almost always egg handling. It is almost always something before the actual incubator. Um, I have tried in the past to um, cause early embryo mortality through improper incubation temperature. And, and they just don't die in that first two or three days unless it's so extreme that you might as well have been cooking it for breakfast. But, you know, when you're getting within a degree or so off of their set points, if we're getting in that range on there. Um, all that's going to do, if you're a little bit high, it's going to develop a little bit quicker. From my standpoint, when we try to temperature abuse those, we got mortality happening um, eight days, nine days, maybe as early as seven days, depending on how that temperature was. When the incubation temperature was low, we would not get that mortality till nine or 10 or 11 days. So basically it was slowing down that development. In neither of those cases was I able to see increased um, embryo mortality in the first two or three days due to improper incubation. Not saying it can't happen, it's just not, um, not that common. We typically are gonna look at something prior to the, happened prior to when the eggs were put in the, in the setters. And again, in that midweek, looking at nutritional issues, um, not to spend much time on this because we don't see this that often, particularly in commercial flocks. And that last week is when we really start focusing in our peaks in um, embryo loss in that last week on a really our incubation. It could be the, the incubators themselves through 18 days, it could be the hatchers, whatever, but that's when we typically see our incubation failures show up as late embryo mortality. Now, can we have, and I've asked this question numerous times, what if we have um, eggs stored for long periods of time that is causing elevated um, early embryo 
somebody, could that also show up as late? Yes, we can actually have some of those situations also show up as late embryo mortality as well. If you're seeing elevated late embryo mortality um, and you're not seeing elevated early embryo mortality, I would question whether that's actually an egg handling issue because you would see both um, elevated at that point. Okay, when we're looking at fertile and infertile, most people know this, don't classify abnormal conditions as fertile. There's normal blood spots in the egg. Um, <clears throat> just not too long ago, I was doing a breakout in a hatchery and there was a little bit of blood in there and, and the, the person doing the breakout saw that and said, is that the embryo? And I was like, no, that's just a blood spot. And I explained how that happened. So you've got a yolk sitting in the um, in a follicle, um, follicular wall of the oviduct. And when that oviduct is getting ready to split and rupture to allow that yolk to be released, there's a um, portion of it called a stigma that blood circulation regresses from that area to cause a tear of that follicular wall to let that yolk or ovum out. If that tear is not straight and a little bit jagged, or if some of those blood um, capillaries don't regress, and that tears, you'll get a little bit of blood leaking onto that yolk. That is not an embryo that happens, that can actually happen in times of stress in our breeders is when they're ovulating a little earlier than they should. Um, so a blood spot is not an embryo. Meat spots, a little bit of tissue from the um, ovary or follicular wall. Mottled yolks, um, discoloration of yolks. Again, what we're concerned with is what's happening at the germinal disc on the yolk, not the whole yolk itself. We looked at, we showed you pictures of where that embryo development occurs, and it's at that germinal disc area. Contamination, uh, chalaza, all those things are not um, fertile. And here's the same picture. So we see in the egg on the right, the fertile egg, how that embryo development begins to grow in a circular fashion, looking like a donut. Um, a little bit bigger picture of the germinal disc, a fertile germinal disc at 12 hours of incubation you can see that that germinal disc is starting to spread. And so that's where our, our embryo development is going to occur. So if you're looking at a slightly discolored yolk, muddled yolk, and it's not directly associated with that germinal disc, I'm not gonna call it embryo development because embryo development will occur right there on the germinal disc area. That's where it'll start. By 24 hours, we can see how that begins to spread and surround that yolk, and from this point on, it continues to grow. And so again, we're looking at the activities at that germinal disc area. So I'm gonna go through some of the days of development, and, and I'm skipping several of the days because they're very repetitive and not as important. Um, infertile eggs, obviously no development. Um, infertility, in my um, experience, is um, almost always a, a situation of decreased mating frequency. Yes, you can have poor males, poor sperm production in the males from a physiological standpoint. 90 plus percent of the time, my experience, I see that it's just infrequent mating, and that's what's causing our infertility. So jump into day three. Um, we have a heart that's beating, and you'll notice my pictures, if you've looked at other embryo mortality charts, I did something different when I was creating this chart and taking these pictures. A lot of these, if we go back, I don't think we back, a lot of these, if you look at um, some of the charts, you'll see at three days what an embryo is, it looks like when it's grown two, three days. What I did here is I let the embryo grow to three days. Then I terminated it and put it back in the incubator for 18 more days. Because when you're doing a breakout, what you're seeing is an embryo that grew to a point in time, three, five, seven, eight days development and then sat in an incubator for the remainder of the time where you have a lot of degradation of materials. So mine don't look quite as pretty as the nice shots we see of actual embryos because this is what we're likely to see when we do a breakup. So day threes, we can see here there's a, a blood ring around that embryo, um, causes low fertility, pre-incubation, poor egg storage, improper egg holding time, holding temperature, Remember, variation in egg holding um, temperatures and it cause a lot of early embryo mortality in addition to uh, long egg storage. Um, day four, um, that's when we see the eye pigment um, readily visible. Um, not as visible from this picture. Um, the picture I showed you before, we could see that pigment. What you would do with this egg, this embryo 
is flip it over and you can kind of see the one on the right, you can see that little dark spot in there. Once you manipulate that embryo just a little, see that eye pigment, then you can move on and, and um, um, look at the next one. Don't spend a lot of time with them. That's, that's one reason why I really emphasize prominent, because I don't want um, people to spend a lot of time looking at them. These just jump out at you and, and then you can move on from there. Day four, again, pre-incubation, poor egg storage, improper egg holding time. Most of the time our um, egg storage issues are gonna be in this, losses are gonna be in this two to three to four um, day range, typically not much longer than that. Our, our big numbers are gonna be in the zero three range when we've had um, storage issues. So moving to day seven, um, the egg tooth begins to appear. Remember, it just begins to appear. If we have a lot of loss there, we could have temperature issues. Um, but again, we uh, often result back to our storage. Day eight, um, the egg tooth is easily visible, as we can see in that embryo on the right. We start seeing that at that point now, we are moving into day eight, and then, then we can um, start looking at different issues um, for our losses. Jumping to day 15, um, the gut begins to be drawn into the cavity, but again, we see prominent chick down on that embryo. And this picture of this embryo, we can see that chick down very easily. And I'm not saying that one at day 14 you can't see it. What I'm saying is look to see if it's prominent because we want it to be very easily um, visible to call it day 15. Day 18, some of the issues we might have here, um, troubleshooting guide, um, again, if we're using um, vaccination program at transfer, um, if they're not transferred at the proper time, we could have, could have some losses due to the, the transfer or the vaccination procedure. Um, or an inconsistent transfer, if it's taken too long to be transferred, they've sat outside of the incubators, um, had some mechanical problems. Um, then you start looking at improper temperature, humidity, ventilation from the incubation uh, process. Day 19, some of the same troubleshooting guides. Again, we can see this. Um, Embryo here, the majority of that yolk is withdrawn into the body cavity. We call that a day 19. And it's important to get everybody on the same page um, of each of these. So we don't go from one week to the next and see variation in our breakout um, uh, data. And that would be purely based on different people, I'm calling it. And so it's important to have everybody on the same page. So day 20, that's when you start looking at you got a poor hatch. If you didn't have problems other places, that's when you start looking at your hatch, your ventilation, your temperature. You could have some turning um, temperature, humidity, ventilation issues in your incubation process as well. Um, but this is when we really start saying, okay, what happened in our hatcher that could have possibly caused this? Because there are a number of factors here as well. Okay, I'm kind of finishing up on some of these other things. Pipped eggs, um, dead in shell. Some people will, will make a determination of live pip, dead pip. Um, but this is a pipped egg. It started that process as an, called an external pip. So it's pipped into the air cell and through the shell into the um, ambient environment. Um, if we have a lot dead at this point, a couple of different things that could go on. Um, our low humidity, temperature, it's kind of delayed our, um, our hatch time. And so they just didn't have enough time to get out. Hatch or humidity could have been low, high temperatures during hatching. Ventilation issues can cause this. Prolonged egg storage, the longer you store eggs, you need to add hours of incubation time to compensate for that. So if we have eggs that are eight, 10, 12 days old and we're trying to pull that hatch the same time we would have on those eggs that are three and four days old, we're gonna have, see some unhatched pips, particularly live unhatched pips, because they just didn't have, really didn't have enough time to, to hatch out. Those are not pipped. Um, essentially, a lot of these are just a little bit behind the others. Some of the same um, issues can, can take place or be causative factors. Inadequate turning, humidity, setter temperature low, so they're just slowed down in their development. They're not quite ready to, to hatch out when it came time to pull the hatch. For small, very small hatcheries, I've talked to some that will actually pull hatches at different times. They'll pull some chicks out that are ready and wait to pull the others, and these are in real small hatcheries. On a large scale, we just can't do that. So when that hatcher is ready to be pulled, we pull what's ready, and then the others just don't make it, and that's where we'll see a lot of pip and not pipped if we um, had some egg storage issues or, or low temperatures. Poor ventilation, egg storage again. Partially pipped, kind of the same as the um, 
the others where we have internal pipping. Again, a lot of this time is is a just a delayed development. Malposition chicks. Um, see a lot of eggs with eggs where the chick is upside down, head in the wrong end of the egg. Eggs can be set small end up, and it is getting a little bit more difficult in some of these eggs to really determine which is the air cell end and which is not. And if those are set upside down, um, you know, that chick will have a hard time orienting itself. And if it's not oriented properly and head at the air cell end of the egg, when it starts to hatch, um, they'll often die. And then we'll pull them out. And, and one of the, the mechanisms of doing an embryo diagnosis is trying to pull that chick out of the egg while observing its position while you're pulling it out. So when you're breaking open that egg, I grab it by the back of the neck and pull it out slowly while observing how its head was turned, if it was under the wing or not, if it's down between its legs, and where it is, was in position with the egg itself. And that will kind of tell, help us know if they were actually malpositioned. And then recording that, um, because an a unusually large number of malpositioned chicks is important to know too. Chicks hatching, hatching early, sometimes that's just um, great differences. Um, or you've got high setter temperature, um, that have just accelerated their development. Um, and, and this can be a problem as well if they're hatching too early, yet we're pulling that hatch at a specific time, we can get some dehydration in our chicks and that'll certainly affects our chick quality. Hatching late, a lot of times this is the same factors as our pips. They just didn't have enough time or we had real large eggs, older breeders, store too long. Um, similar to what our pips would be where they're just really coming out a little bit late. Call those green chicks a lot, they're just not quite um, ready. Uh, to be put out in the field. Slow hatch or drawn out hatch, so we don't have a, a nice narrow hatch window. We could have a mixture of eggs, some store too long, some too short, mixture of breed or breed strains, mixture of large and small eggs, and proper handling. And the other thing is important, hotter cold spots in the setters or hatchers and in our egg storage, both. Um, skeletal mal malformations, um, it could be egg storage, handling, um, some disease issues possibly, and recording these, um, a lot of people don't really record these, but recording um, incidences particularly of like multiple truncation, I call it, where you have this chick here has um, basically multiple truncation at the back end, so it's got extra legs. You see often you'll see chicks with, um, with two heads or two beaks, and so you've got multiple truncation on both ends. That can be a high temperature issue early in incubation period. Crossbeat, missing eye again, temperature too high, um, or turning problems. This picture here, you can see some chicks with four legs and two heads and um, some in there with just barely two beaks. And so that's some of our issues of malformations. And if we see a lot of this calling multiple truncation, we can look at temperature issues early on. Um, poor chick quality, again, um, some of that comes with our delayed hatches, our draggy hatch. Um, large hatch window, mixture of eggs from all the young breeders. We try and keep our eggs, when possible, as close to um, consistent with our egg or our breeder flock age and size and strain as possible. Can't always do that, but that is the ideal situation, particularly in our multi or in our single stage machines. Open or, unheal, open or unhealed navels, temperature too high, um, hatch or temperature too low. Maybe high, some of these things will actually cause either the, the, the navel to close too quickly or not quick enough, depending on what the issue is. Basically, it's unhealed navel. One of the big problems with those unhealed navels is those chicks then go out and sit in the hatch basket with all the other chicks with an open navel, which is an invitation for anything to come inside, any bacterial contamination. So if there's a combination of contamination issues and open navels, we're looking at a disaster out in the, in the roller farm or when we place them. That also can come with um, just um, placing them out in a, in a chicken house with open navels. And kind of the same thing there, red hawks, sometimes that's just a struggle with hatching. Be some um, heat temperature issues stuck in the shell, a lot of times that's temperature, humidity. And we start seeing a lot of chicks with um, egg membrane parts um, stuck to them. Uh, brain exposed, you could have some high CO2 levels. We don't see that as a cause and effect of that often. Equipment malfunction, I think, is more often the cause if we see some um, issues as far as the trans transporting or and handling of the chicks. But our high temperatures can definitely cause it. If it's in excess, again, we have to know what's normal. 
So bottom line is, is we're just trying to produce the best quality chicks we can, as many as we can, and it's not just the number of chicks we produce, it's the number and quality of the chicks. We really want those things not just hatched to be um, excellent chicks when they get out into the field. So we'll entertain any questions, I guess, from now, right? We will. Wow. That was uh, a, a little lot fast. Of, a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information. Um, but super interesting for me and I'm sure for everyone else. Um, let me just take the presentation down there so you can see us all. There you go. So uh, if anyone has any questions, oh, we have one from, I'm sorry if I destroy your name here, uh, Vincinius, I think. Um, what is the difference in age of matrices can be mixed for housing the chicks? So are you asking? I think, I think what you're asking, if I'm right, is the difference in age of the chicks at housing, I believe. I think so. So, so uh, ideally, obviously, ideally, we want to put chicks down that are all of the same age and the same size. Because if we, even if we put chicks down the same age, but from very different breeder flock, breeder flock sources, if we have a difference in the chick size, that difference in uniformity is going to make it difficult to manage those properly from a water standpoint, feed standpoint, and then just a pure competition standpoint. So taking it to, I believe what your question is, is what the difference in age, if I believe what you're asking is, can we put chicks down that are like a day older than the others or two days older or something like that? That is not recommended. Uh, I mean, I'll be the first one to say, hey, you can do what you got to do. Um, sometimes you're in a pinch and you have to do some things, but as a general practice, it is not recommended to mix those. And, it, and when I've seen that happen to where they've had a long hatch one day, short the next, where they just put a partial hatch down and had to refill it the next day, again, that's one of those things sometimes you have to do. Certainly would not do that if at all possible. Um, it's just going to cause a little bit more problems and difficulties in managing those birds. For sure, for sure it would. Um, is there anything you can do, say you do have that situation whereby you could put up a barrier or something in your barn that would at least keep those chicks separate? Would there be a point where you could put them back together or they would be separated? You definitely could do that if, if need be. You could go and say, okay, if you have a portion of them that were placed one day and you just had to bring in the others. It, if it's possible to isolate those out, to let them. The important thing is, is let them get started on feed water um, as easily as possible. So yes, if you could um, separate those, allow them to get that first start. You could probably even go a day just to get that first start in food and water and then release them out because obviously you don't want to manage two groups of birds, um, but that will help the situation. I do know one producer that raises alternative birds and he, he raises small birds and large birds and he broods them together. He starts as small birds and three days later, he will put his bigger birds in there. He basically gives the small ones a three-day jump start on food and water before he adds the chicks that are a little bit bigger. They tend to do better that way in this situation. That's what he has to do. Um, but really just giving those first, those last ones added the jump start on food and water before they're out competed for it. All right. Um, Javier and Fernando, thank you for your feedback. Uh, we're really glad that you guys enjoyed uh, the presentation thus far. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us, guys. Um, Jose uh, says, hi, doctor. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's from perhaps Panama. He's asking, what's the correct percent to rend him into chick? Do you? Oh, the, pet, the correct number to check. Well, I can answer this as a as a previous academic scientist that has to run stats on things. Um, you know, obviously, and, I, and I've given this answer in this way before. I mean, if you want to do a random or a sampling of your flocks, if you have you know uh, one hatch basket that's got 168 eggs in it, and you do one, you're going to get one basket for 100,000 eggs or something. You're going to get an estimate. Two is going to be better than one. Four is going to be better than two. Eight is going to be better than four, and every basket is going to be <laughs> best. However, you have to figure out what works for you. Typically, I think most places will do three and four, three to four hatch baskets per flock that they're sampling, and that gives you a pretty good um, representative sample. Again, depending on how many you've got in that batch, but three to four um, basket sample is 
it's typically, um, uh, again, it's going to give you a workable number. But again, you know, hey, the more the barrier, but we've all got to pay the bill somewhere, so we can't do everything. That's it. Fernando is asking, is there any uh, differences to the statistics um, between layers and board? Um, you typically are going to see a little bit more early deads in our boilers and our layers. Our layers, one of the things that we've done as an industry is we've selected layers. If you think about it, we've selected layers for reproductive characteristics. Lay a lot of eggs. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's those are all reproductive characteristics. Our broilers we have selected for meat conversion, growth rate, um, and by doing that, we have inadvertently entered into a realm where we're also negatively selecting um, or selecting against reproductive characteristics. There's a negative correlation between the two. So the the more we push towards growth rate conversion, we're actually going to bring in a little bit more reproductive problems. It doesn't mean we can't get the same results, it just means they're more difficult. So when we used to be able to raise some of our breeder birds very similar to layers to get the same fertility, hatchability, um, chick livability, um, we can get very close to it now. It's just much more difficult than it used to be. You can't cut the corners anymore. So we will see higher, typically higher embryo mortality in our boiler lines. Some of that is due to just we can't get the fertility. You know, we have to manage our breeders in such a manner to try and maintain um, their ability to naturally mate. We don't have to. So we're going to see a little bit more um, struggles with our meat birds and we wore all our layers just because of the nature of how we've developed both of those uh, strains of birds. Okay. So then also are you seeing differences um, from breed to breed and do the different genetics companies have, you know, expected ranges published out there? They do. The different, the, when we're, we're, when we're talking about commercial or, or really alternative non-commercial, but we'll just stick with commercial here. Yeah. There are, you know, put me in a corner and force me to say it, which one's better than the other. There's not. They can all differently sometimes to get that. For instance, within one company, um, a couple of their hen strains, we might have a slightly different stage versus single stage. Oh, design for incubation equipment? I think so, yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, in my opinion, the single stage is definitely the way to go because. When we when we started in multi stage, you know, decades ago, there were some very good reasons for that. As one one of the reasons was for energy efficiency. Let's let the embryos that are producing heat produce heat, and then let's design a machine that will then help transfer that heat to the younger embryos that require heat, so our machines aren't working as hard. And that was the reason we did that. Um, the reason we're moving towards single stage now is one, we become more efficient at producing that heat. And two, we can give the embryo what it wants. For instance, we have found in our single stage equipment um, that we can start out at say 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit at the beginning and drop all the way down to the 98s, upper 98s, somewhere in there towards the end. That is better for the embryo. So think about our multi-stage. We have to put all the embryos in there that are zero day development to 17, 18 day development, and they all get the same temperature. And so we're basically having to give them the average for all the embryos, but not specifically what an embryo gets. So we're a little bit, we're able to provide the embryo more of what it wants with the modern equipment. Okay. Um, kind of along that line, Diego has a question. Uh, what's the acceptable percentage of discarding uh, a birth or a hatch, I guess, in multi-stage machines? What sort of losses would you be looking at? Oh, like um, mortality losses? I think so. I, I still think, and, I, and I, we see some really good results, even from our multi-stage equipment. We really do as far as um, chick numbers and hatchability. Um, you know, I'll, I'll stay in my range in there of, say, there's 4 to 5% total embryo mortality that's normal. So when by saying that, if, if somebody's um, facility and management design, they get, you know, what I've seen, early embryo mortality down less than 2%, um, 1.5%, whatever. Typically, if you're going to see that, you might see a little bit higher late mortality because there's still that 
you know, four to five percent that biologically just aren't going to make it. They may die early, they may die late. So your total ember mortality, a realistic goal is to get around that four to five percent total ember mortality, early, middle, late combined, um, and then break that up pretty much evenly between early and late mortality. Um, you don't want one of them to get too excessive, but again, four to five percent total mortality is a is a goal I think everybody should shoot for. That's about the best we can do, really. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a ton of questions. Uh, Paul is asking, uh, what should the weight of the yolk in relationship to the uh, chick at hatch be? Um, yolk, and again, there's some differences in our breed strains between that and in our incubation profile and how we, how we manage those eggs. Um, you know, we're going to see some, and, it, and it's hard, and I don't know whether you're talking about a, one of our modern strains that we typically use or not, um, but um, if you're extracting the yolk out of the chicks um, and doing it at hatch, I would I would be kind of guessing to say because there's there are some variations in there of what you should expect and want. Again, what I would look at is what do you normally see on your best quality chicks. Go to your very best chicks. What the best quality that we see out in the field, and what are we seeing in those, and then do a comparative factor because there are variations in there and, and sometimes it's, it's a little dangerous to say boom you want when it's like okay well we're getting that why don't we get the quality so take the best chicks you have and then extract that out and see what um, what you see from the best and then your situation that's the goal that you should shoot for that's good advice. it's really going into to what I always like to go to the best situation what works the best analyze that and compare to that for your situation because everybody's everywhere is a little bit different um, we have a question from Anonymous. Uh, anonymous. Anonymous, I know. Uh, do these modern high yielding breeds require different incubation te temperatures or incubation management than the breeds of before? They do a little uh, different. I mean, we're actually seeing that now. Even today, we might do a slightly different incubation profile between one um, primary breeder line and another, actually between two primary breeders or three primary breeders, or whatever, but also within the lines within those, we do see some differences. I think this is, is a moving target because as the geneticists are constantly selecting for uh, improvement and changes is the reason why we see a little bit different differences in them. And so, um, yeah, your, your um, Primary breeders are typically going to be able to offer that to you. I mean, we kind of know what they are. I'm kind of hesitant to say it right here of what the differences are, but there are differences. And so when I go and work with hatchery managers and they say, okay, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, they say, well, we're running this breed strain and this one and this one. And if they have the exact same temperature profile and incubation time, there's differences in incubation time too. Some are hatching or ready for hatch sooner than others. Um, then they're not really managing what they have. They really need to be looking at what they have. So yes, there are differences, make the long answer short, but um, uh, it's um, kind of a moving target because it will change. All right, we are um, nearing the end. I just want to let uh, anyone who has a question left for us, there's uh, Vincius, Jose, and Daryl. We will get to your questions, um, but as people are dropping out, I just want to make sure everyone knows that our next webinar uh, will be the second part to this series, and it's going to be on the development of the embryo and going through that in a little more detail. Um, so please do join us in February for that. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day um, that's dropping out there. But uh, yeah, if anyone else has more questions, you can definitely throw them up, and we'll, uh, we'll keep going on those. The, the SIS is not going to shut us down um, all of a sudden at 12. So. Uh, Jose is asking, what's the cause of chicks with their brain outside? Exposed brain. Mm -hmm. um, we can see the exposed brains, um, and, and that kind of goes along sometimes with our um, high heat temperatures early on. Um, along with exposed brains, we will often see sometimes our multiple truncation. Um, but that's an issue where, uh, again, if it's abnormal, we'll start looking at some excessive temperature on there. And now, what is that normal? You know, I was in a hatchery one time and they said, oh, we're seeing a lot of these exposed brains. And somebody from the outside had come in and broken eggs open. And when we actually determined that the little flat of eggs he had came from 100,000 eggs that came from another group of more than that, the percentage they had was actually 
very reasonable in the normal range. And so that's where we look at just biology. So if you're starting to get percent, percent and a half, two percent, yeah, then we might start having an issue, but you're probably going to see some other issues as well. Um, but yeah, you start looking at some high temperatures early on potentially. Okay, great. Um, Vincius has a question, how often should the embryo diagnosis be done and what's the sampling percentage? Um, it kind of goes back to the other question is what's the percentage on there? Typically in a, in a big commercial hatchery, we're looking at three to four hatch baskets per flock. How often you do that is a purely a situation and it has to be determined at your hatchery level. It's an economic situation. Um, I, ideally, I think hatcheries will do these um, every flock every week. I know a lot of hatcheries do. Every single flock will have an embryo diagnosis done sometime in egg set that week. I know others will start that and then during the peak production times they might do a flock every two weeks, each flock every two or three weeks because they're hatching good, they know they are, and for just reduced man hours they don't break every single one open. As they get a little bit older and they start seeing hatch problems they will maybe do them more frequently on certain flocks. So um, no more than once a week for sure, doing them once a week per flock is a management decision if you've got the people to do it. Um, and the need, then, then that's a good, uh, a good frequency to, to do an embryo diagnosis. We don't need to get crazy with it and do it all the time. Right. Um, so Daryl has a question. Uh, he is currently de decreasing his incubator wet bulb set point in order to increase uh, his moisture loss percentage at transfer. His incubator wet bulb set point is uh, lower than hatcher wet bulb. And I'm, just, I'm assuming it sounds like he has multi-stage. Um, he wants to know, should his incubator and hatcher wet bulbs be the same? Should they be equal or? It's, it's actually more important to have your um, ending setter temperature and hatcher temperature. Those two closer to temperature just for the, um, the embryo itself and moving from one incubator to the other, you're not having a drastic change in there. The humidity is one of those things that, you know, we can have a change in humidity walking out the door. You know, we're going to notice a change in temperature walking out the door. It's like, wow, it's really cold or really hot, but we're not, but in, if it's excessive humidity, we might notice that, but we don't really notice that that much. So trying to um, care for the embryo and the stress level of the embryo by trying to match humidity levels is really not an important issue at that point. We want to get the proper moisture loss through 18 days, and then from that point, we want to maintain our humidity in our hatchers, basically to get get the hatch that we want. That you know, depending on how much you ventilate, different things, there's various factors there. But trying to match the two is not really important from the standpoint of the stress level of the embryo at all. It's, it's I mean, you keep it relatively close just because that's what you would do in your normal incubation and hatcher profiles. But as far as the embryo itself, it's not going to be. Um, stressed out if there's a big difference in that humidity level. Yeah. And Daryl, I'd like to um, encourage you if you want to email us uh, webinars at jamesway.com. Um, if you have any more questions or maybe we can do a bit more of a deep dive with you on uh, on what you're, go what you're going through right now, where your set points are versus sort of where recommended right. set points would be, um, specifically for breed and flock age and, and all those sort of things. Um, and, we could get you in contact with one of our consultants who can uh, help you via email um, to work through the issues you're having. Yeah, there's a lot of variables in, in there, so sometimes some questions are hard to answer specifically and directly. That is a, is a wide ranging answer for everything, so yeah, we can definitely fine yeah. tune your work with you. And, uh, and yeah, that definitely goes for everyone else on as well. If you have anything, um, that does need a bit of a specific deep dive, you can always uh, feel free to email us. You can always email us ahead of a webinar as well if you have a question you do want on air, um, and that gives me a chance to go back to you and ask a few more detailed questions so that uh, if there is something we're looking for, we can, we can be prepared in terms of um, extra information we may need for specific issues. So thank you everyone. Um, if there are any more questions, please drop them in that Q&A box uh, pretty quickly, but I see we're all dropping off. Uh, everyone's probably headed out to lunch or whatever you're up to for the rest of the day. So thank you for joining us all. Um, as per usual, you will get an email uh, with a link to the recording. Um, if you've missed the last 
recordings that they are up on our YouTube, James Way Incubators YouTube. Uh, you can just put in even webinar Wednesdays or James Way Incubators and it should come up for you. Uh, the links are also on our website, jamesway.com slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Tongue twister today. Glad you got all that. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, so thank you everyone and I hope to see you next month when we're going to be discussing embryo development and then uh, for March we have uh, a couple fun surprises for you that maybe I'll tell you about next time. <laughs> all right. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>